Thank you for listening to episode three of the epilogue. I'm Joe Guarneri. Today, we're digging pretty deep into one of the most intimidating, disturbing novels of the postmodern tradition. It rivals Gravity's Rainbow in its density and the recognitions in its illusions. And Michael Silverblatt called it the most beautiful, most complex, most disturbing novel to be published in his lifetime. Today, we are talking about a book that is the product of almost 30 years of work, William Gass's The Tunnel. Before we start, um, I want to give a huge thank you and shout out to John Mahoney for the new intro music for the podcast. John is an old friend of mine. And he is the guitarist for the band Crybaby, a phenomenal up-and-coming psychedelic rock band that's been playing all over the Northeast recently. I wish I could talk about music with the confidence I can for literature because there is so much to say about these guys. Just a great sound that respects and cherishes classic psychedelic rock and casts upon it this great modernized flair. And you can check them out on Instagram at Crybaby Music. That's C R Y B A B I Music. All right, let's get into the episode. William Gass was a graduate of Kenyon College. He got his PhD at Cornell, and all of his degrees were in philosophy. So he taught philosophy and humanities at the College of Worcester, Purdue University, and Washington University in St. Louis. The philosophy influence is very evident in his work, of course. It's pretty easy to speculate, too, that his own life as an academic and his own experiences as a college professor inspired the events and the writing of the book we're going to talk about today. So the tunnel is the quintessential metafictional work. So you have this character of Frederick Kohler, a middle-aged university professor of history um, who sets out to write an introduction to his opus entitled Guilt and Innocence in Hitler's Germany. And he ends up writing The Tunnel, which is a 600-plus page account of his childhood, his work, his colleagues, marriage, love, aging, and his family, with plenty of mind-bending commentary on the Nazis, the teaching of history, and the state of modern America. And somehow, William Gass is able to, to make all of this connect and feel like one huge narrative Um, as much as that's possible in a work like this, obviously. And throughout the writing of this account, the character of Kohler begins to dig a tunnel in his basement. It's it's unclear what exactly sparks this. The way I read this was that he's doing it almost as an outlet. It's the only outlet he can seem to think of to relieve these long-held feelings of quiet resentment. So the only way he's able to ease this inward torment is to dig into something that is not himself. So early on in the book, we learn that Kohler spent time in Germany as a young man, uh, a college student. He witnessed Kristallnacht and studied under a German philosopher by the name of Magus Tabor, who's kind of an early Nazi sympathizer. Among readers of the book, and the tunnel kind of rides the line between being a cult work and not, so discussion on the the book is very limited. There seems to be a debate on Kohler's true stance on Hitler and the Nazis. Some consider him a Nazi sympathizer, some don't. The interpretation I got is that he represents sort of a middle ground He's not a full-blown sympathizer per se, but he rather sympathizes with how in the right historical context and the right set of circumstances, someone or some group of people can commit such atrocities. So the novel, of course, is supposed to highlight this both in the average person and Hitler. 
directly. I want to begin with one quote from the book that encapsulates this. So now my book is done. Guilt and innocence in Hitler's Germany needs only its impossible introduction to go forth. And what is all my labor worth? What does my work do but simply remove some of the armor, the glamour of evil? It small ease it. It shakes a little sugar on the shit. It dares to see a bit of the okay in our great pugabash. Inexcusable. Slander our saints, if you will. But please leave our Satan undefiled by any virtue, his successes inexplicable by any standard. Great undulating banners red as blood, and the brass bands, and the manly thud of uniformly set down boots, and the rage inside the happy shouts. A hundred thousand spleens have found a mouth. Curtains of sperm are flung up the side of the sky. Hell has fertilized heaven, and now the hero comes the trumpet of his people, and his voice is enlarged like a movie lion's. He roars, he screams, so well for everyone. His tantrums tame a people. He is the son of God, if God is resentment. And God is resentment, a pharaoh for the disappointed people. Note the phrase, disappointed people. So Kohler coins this metaphorical collective, the Party of Disappointed People, or PDP, which includes anyone who's been dealt a terrible hand in life, ostensibly through no fault of their own and solely as a result of their environments and the actions of those around them. So it's the downtrodden, the unheard, the dregs of society who suffer in silence and isolation, who may sit next to you in the doctor's office waiting room or on the subway or who work in the office right next to yours. People you assume to be completely normal, yet who are tormented mentally. They're one step away from breakdown. So in this passage, Kohler is metaphorically justifying this and justifying membership in this fictional party through the symbolic justification of Hitler's rise in Germany in the years leading up to World War II. Kohler writes more on this later in his account. To look ahead at life and see the future drawing away as though from the rear of a train and with not even a wave from anyone to pretend we were there. Not even a little trash beneath a table, as if there might have been a picnic. To have been battered by life with scarcely a batter in return, a scar on a tree or a mark on a wall, not so much as a Kilroy or a look of apprehension in an eye. Nothing given, nothing gotten, because nothing was offered, and everything refused. To have been had so thoroughly, as that is eventually to go about with a black cloth draped over the ruin of the heart, my heart. The heart you see here, taken by stethoscope. Because I was promised this and got that. Because I never used life. Because life used me. Low down where you wipe. So now I'm soiled, flung away, and will be flushed without a look. That's what I feel when I feel. When I smell. That's what we all smell. We all feel. This shit on our cheeks from other cheeks. We, embers of the party of the disappointed people. And were fortune's crooked wheel to luck us the opportunity, if even a little power should come our way like a windfall from a distant relative's will, if we had in the bank just enough authority saved up to keep open an account, then what damage we would do, what revenge we would take, just like that bleeding balcony there you're looking at. That's how my smile would be. See the rotten spindles? If for the briefest bit of blessed time, I, my habitually helpless hand, once, once, just once, held the whip. If we were to impossibly oil down the novel to one passage, this would be my pick. It encapsulates the novel's two most poignant points on history and atrocity. One, that individuals are not fully to blame for their actions, even the most horrific ones, that there is something of it left chance and context. And two, that the concepts of guilt and innocence, as well as the concepts of cause and effect for that matter, philosophically are really just products of interpretation. Who's writing 
the history, who's propagandizing in Kohler's words. So here's what Kohler tells us about this. Neither guilt nor innocence are ontological elements in history. They are merely ideological factors to which a skillful propaganda can seem to lend a causal force, and in that fashion furnish others. In disguise of their greed as it may be, their terror sometimes, pride possibly, remorse even, or more often, surly resentment. A superficially plausible apologia for tomorrow's acts of robbery or cowardice, revenge, rape, or other criminalities already underway. Because the past cannot promise its future the way a premise stands in line with a ticket good for its conclusion, the past is never a justification, only a poor excuse. It confers no rights and rights no wrongs. It is even more heartless than Hitler. And if there is truly a diabolical ingredient to events in the victims and vicissitudes of time, as has been lately alleged, it lies in the nature of history itself. For it is the chronicle of the cause which causes, not the cause, as has herein been amply deduced, clearly and repeatedly explained, cruelly proved. So I see most of the novel as... Kohler's account of how he ended up in this figurative PDP. His childhood is the initial cause. So he lived under an austere father and a manic mother, isolated, frustrated by one unfortunate circumstance after another with no happiness seeming to come his way. And within this, there's a hatred for the things that Kohler associates with his upbringing. For example, suburban life and its takeover by commercialization. Early on in the book, he describes this. Although Elm Street has long since lost its trees to disease and its fine old homes are dental clinics, cleaners, barber and beauty shops, or mortuaries now, their spacious front porches nailed meanly shut or glass bricked up like bars, their large lawns, little parking lots, their facades at night lit by a loud, harsh, pearly light. Its name still stands for a past that was energetic and objective, like Freight Street and Brewery and Court. So even if Hemery Lane and Happy Hollow date like dresses, and we can place them in their period the way we can calendar kids called Ozzy or girls named Cheryl, The sort of history they contain refers exclusively to states of mind, to fads and furbelows, to illusions, and points only at the people who chose them, and never toward the things or persons they stand for. Not at Marjean, the timid little math whiz, or Junior James, the football star, or Fat Freddy, the schoolyard bully, but to their thoughtless, arrogant, tasteless parents. Gas, or rather Kohler, I should say, does this throughout the novel. He's he's able to take the most mundane subjects, a doctor's visit, his father's refusal to uh, to buy a family dog, and and draw out of them the most dense, disturbing commentary. And Kohler's hatred both of the past and of change is contradictory. The further irony of which is that he is a historian. So in theory, he should respect history. This is one of the the bases of the section entitled, We Have Not Lived the Right Life. It sometimes seems to me, in morbidly fanciful moments, as if age were aimed at, not simply suffered, for I fled my youth as if it were a disease. I wanted adolescence as I wanted its acne, and I can believe those who argue that memory is not enough to establish the reality of the self, because the selves I remember, I remember like photos in the family album. He eschews his boyhood completely. He even sardonically notes that his affair with a student of his, a woman named Lou, is the true beginning of his life. Should I begin when I was born as history would have me, a child of time to come between two ticks into the world with only talks to follow? Yet I did not begin when I was born, but later. Then, 
just once in love, I was where nothing was before or after. And his account of the affair is one of the novel's few grasps at beauty and something heartfelt. I recall Gass saying in an interview with Michael Silverblatt that he is highly sentimental. And these specific sections really show just how much. So there's a a point where he describes the end of his relationship with this student who he's having an affair with. Just as I feel the culp come up in me when I malice my Martha, my misery, my missus, I felt it then, losing without grace or even decency the only satisfying lover in my life, because I had put the problem in those words, getting the sack, and then seeing only the hard oblique light from the spoons, the lift of the little length of cellophane like a sail in that short sigh of air, your smoothly filed and lacquered nails tweezing a cigarette from its pack, a fragment of tobacco clinging to one red edge, and then remembering the smell of orange peel on my fingers, as if it were my own quick and not the fruits, each step of my mind taking me further away from what was happening, and indeed what was happening, from the terrible turn in your feelings, like the corner of the cafe, because, I presume, I couldn't bear to sit there and watch your tongue remove a small residue of chocolate from your lips the way you were removing me. There are too many incredible parts of this book. You could could do a 100-episode podcast strictly on the tunnel, to be perfectly honest, But I want to point out one example of the incredibly interesting way Gas is able to twist the mundane and the ordinary into something related to the novel's threads of commentary on history and on memory. For example, there's a segment of the novel called Blackboard in which Kohler does a deep philosophical analysis combining the physical items of chalk and the blackboard with history and the concept of remembering. What I wonder at is the way in which such objects assume an enormous significance in my life. They are like catch basins and would collect me if I were rain. It is in these places that I find myself again, as if the image in the water were really made of water and were really in the puddle where it seems to be. Proust's little shell-shaped cake, reminding Proust of pages, but all that M remembers hurries him farther away from that smell, that taste, the tea time that started it off. I assume we all associate, if none of us do it as well, moving along old tracks from place to place in our past like a memory-driven train. But history, as I especially feel it, deposits itself inside its surroundings in objects, unlike actions which are marked by being almost immediately over, in things which hang around the way the corpse does after the hanging's done, as the earth does over the criminal's grave, and the rope itself, which feels its own burns in abraded places, in things, unlike thoughts which shed their individuality and immediately swim into anonymity becoming so many figures, so many fish, so many electromagnetic waves, in my mother's rings, in my aunt's nested boxes, my father's car, in the dregs of every day where my life composts itself. And then if we keep going in this extremely long passage, I don't want to read all of it, of course. So that everything a blackboard does to remind me of my childhood, my pupil days or my profession, tells me about the blackboard too tells me about chalk and me, geometry in me, erasers and dull walls, windows in me, swastikas in myself. Concerning both, I've more than once made a clean slate. For history, I do believe, is not a mighty multitude of causes whose effects we suffer now in some imaginary present. It is rather that the elements of every evanescent moment endeavor to hitch a ride on something more permanent living on in what lives on, lengthening their little life by clinging to a longer one, and in that matter, though perhaps quite unintentionally, 
attaching what will be to what still is, the way a word's former employments are the core of what it presently means. And this goes on for a long time after this. It's a a very long, multiple-page passage. But to me, this was just one of the most beautiful, complex to shamelessly paraphrase Michael Silverblatt, parts of the book. And Gass was able to turn a phrase like no other. Even the most difficult parts of the tunnel seem to sing and to resonate like the easiest and simplest of prose. So the tunnel is an experience. It's 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 obviously it's not a relaxing coffee shop read. The best way I can describe it is that it's it's like a cognitive version of a difficult workout. It draws you in, though you you may still procrastinate getting into it. You may even dread it at times. But when the reading session is over, you feel like you've strengthened your mind. When the book is over, you're glad you did it because really there isn't anything like this. There is justified criticism against the book, um, especially when it came out. It was ridiculed quite a bit. It's easy to find the book unnecessarily formless, bloated, even pretentious. Um, But I think that's the point. A long life of anguish does not lead to linearity simplicity or brevity when it comes to the processing of that agony that's going to do it for episode three as always if you are enjoying this podcast feel free to leave a rating um, and share it with others who might enjoy it if you are checking this out via youtube feel free to subscribe and comment and i am really interested in any feedback I can get on this. So that's that. William Gass's The Tunnel, uh, phenomenal work. If you are into experimental prose and you have not gotten into this uh, just yet, I highly recommend putting it on your list for 2022 um, because it is just a work unlike anything I've ever read. So that's going to do it, and I hope to see you around for next episode. Thanks again.